Welcome back to our weekly Bible study through the book of Matthew. I trust that you guys all had a good Thanksgiving. I know mine was filled with family, food, and football. The three F's of Thanksgiving. I ate too much turkey and stuffing, but it was a blessed time. Moving on, I have a few announcements this week. Our second mini-series is coming up. It's two weeks long, and it's from January 3rd to January 10th. Remember, in the mini-series, you get to invite guys out to our Bible study, and they get to practice, they get to participate in our Bible study for two weeks without needing to sign up for the class. Your group leaders have the two-week study guide in PDF format, all ready for you guys to send out to your family, friends, and coworkers. If you're listening to our Bible study online, and you're not an official member of our group, I'm going to put a link in the description so that you can download the mini series study guide. Also, I've been putting the lecture outline in the YouTube comment section as well for your use. As we have learned this week in this week's study, ask the Lord of the harvest who you should invite to our mini series and follow through by sending them the information. Also, as part of your part in the harvest field, I would ask you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and share this video with others. Well, it's that time of year again. Our BSF Christmas break is coming up. Our last day of 2021 will be, will be Monday, December 6th, and we will return on January 3rd which will be the first night of our mini-series. According to our tradition, the last class night afterwards, we gather for a few minutes and eat cookies and have a chance to fellowship with one another until we meet back up in 2022. So next Monday, be sure to stop for cookies and fellowship before heading out for home. For you guys who are listening to us online, or are in one of our satellite groups, your group leader will have an end of the year fellowship for you guys. That's it for the announcements. Let's go ahead and bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, as we approach this scripture, we pray that it will, that it will do a work in us, that you will continue to sanctify us through your truth and continue to transform us to be men that are pleasing to you. In Christ's powerful name, amen. As we move into our study today, I'm sure many of you guys were on sports teams or were members in the military. And as such, you were confronted with leaders or coaches who through tough, encouraging words got you to excel greater than you ever thought you could. Well, when I think of a motivating coach our military leader, the two guys I think of are Vince Lombardi or George S. Patton. Both men have many quotes that not only motivated the guys they were leading, but they still continue to be hard hitting, impactful, tough sayings that are meaningful to the generations after them. I have a few of the quotes from both men up on the screen and you guys can quickly read through them but let me just read them for the guys who might be listening to the audio. From Coach Lombardi, winners never quit and quitters never win. Winning isn't everything, it's the only thing. The only place success comes before work is in the dictionary. And from General Patton, a pint of sweat will save a gallon of blood. Lead me follow me or get out of my way. Say what you mean and mean what you say. What makes these quick quotes so impactful, both men had a way of taking timeless truth and putting it into a short phrase which made them rememberable. These quotes often make people stop and think and say, what did he mean by that? Well, this week in our study, Jesus starts disciple boot camp where he says some tough sayings, which makes us stop and think, what did he mean by that? But these tough, truthful sayings 
will help carry the disciples through their difficult mission of taking Jesus' message out to the world. Therefore, we will divide this week's passage in three divisions. Division one, Matthew chapter nine, verses 35 through chapter 10, verse 15, unexpected workers and calling. Our second division is Matthew chapter 10, verses 16 through 31, unexpected persecution and value. And our last division is chapter 10, verses 32 through 42, unexpected cost and rewards. As we get into our first division today, unexpected workers and calling, we see the scripture today is the second major teaching in the book of Matthew. The first was the Sermon on the Mount to the disciples and the crowd, but this teaching was only to the disciples. The crowds were not present. From this passage, it's obvious that the focus is on the training of the disciples, but in the training, there are ageless truths that help prepare the church for centuries of service. If you turn your attention to the outline of Matthew on the screen, you will again review the literary chiasm of Matthew. Remember, a chiasm is a literary structure shaped like an arrowhead. Chapter 8 and 9 was a narrative section regarding the miracles of Jesus, and chapter 10 is another discourse from Jesus. And as far as the icons on the left, Jesus' first teaching was on a mountaintop, and this one is on land. And when we get to the parables in chapter 13, we will see Jesus teach from the water, which is at the end point of the chiasm. If you haven't already done so, please open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 9 as we start today in verse 35. Jesus, in the opening of our study today, justified the reason for all evangelistic crusades, which we find in verse 37. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. As you guys are aware, BSF included the end of chapter 9 in, our ch in chapter 10 study. But why did they do that? It's because these last verses in chapter 9 give us the backdrop and context for the disciples' training in chapter 10. It's interesting that before Jesus sent out the disciples, Jesus encouraged them to pray and ask for workers to work the harvest field, which we read in verse 38. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. As you move along in your Christian journey, you will see an irony to this life, which is, those who pray for an answer often become the answer to the prayer. And as you serve God in whatever ministry he calls you to, verse 36 reveals the heart of Jesus, which should also be our heart when we serve. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus demonstrated love and compassion, and the disciples witnessed it. And this love and compassion transformed the disciples' hearts and their outlook on life. As we move into chapter 10, verse 1, is a watershed moment for the disciples. So let's read it. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. Something to notice before Jesus gives his authority, he calls his disciples. God's servants don't self-promote themselves. God calls you into service. Even BSF leaders are called by God to serve in this ministry. We are not men who are just filling a gap or biding our time until something else comes along. We are men who have been called by God to serve him in BSF. Well, for the last two weeks, we've been studying Jesus's authority, and now, just like that, he gives us authority to his team of disciples. Only a sovereign God would feel comfortable of giving so much power to a ragtag team of men. This giving of authority wasn't a long, drawn-out process, but it was a supernatural process that Jesus simply gave to them. 
Think of it. Jesus gave the disciples divine authority, even Judas Iscariot. So let's meet the team, which if you turn your attention to the slide, you will see. In all four instances, when the disciples are listed in the Bible, Peter is always listed first, which means he was the leader of the disciples, even though he would fail on the night that Jesus was arrested. And unfortunately, Judas Iscariot was always mentioned last, which gives us further evidence of his future betrayal. Something else you'll notice from the list, there is no Hercules, Achilles, Odysseus, or Perseus. These men were blue collar guys and a tax collector. Nothing special about any of them. These guys are unexpected workers with an unexpected calling. No doubt, at the time, these men could not have understood the impact they would have in God's plan for the ages. Do you remember that 1967 war movie called The Dirty Dozen, where Lee Marvin, an army major, led a team of unlikely soldiers to victory? Well, that's how I think of the early years of the disciples. But Jesus would take this unlikely group of men and mold them into an unstoppable force. Well, in verse five, it makes it clear that it's game time now. And as we, and we read the following, these 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. The game plan came with specific instructions detailed in verses five through 15. The BSF notes cover these verses in detail. And I hope you guys are reading the notes because they're excellent. But I'm going to move quickly through these verses. If you turn your attention to the slide, it summarizes the checklist that Jesus gave the disciples, which was simply, do not go to Gentile or Samaritan towns, but instead go to the lost sheep of Israel. Proclaim the kingdom of heaven is near while healing the sick, raising the dead, cleansing lepers, and driving out demons. Since they freely received, the disciples were to freely give. They were not to take any money, no bag, no extra shirt, sandals, or a staff. Once they arrived at the towns, they were to search out for a worthy person and stay at their house. When they entered the house, they were to give it a greeting and discern whether if the house, household was deserving or not. And if so, the disciples were to let their peace rest. If not, they were to let their peace return back to them. So what do you think are some of the main points Jesus is trying to teach the disciples from the first half of the list? Well, maybe the importance of having a simple message and sticking to Jesus's message, the importance of having compassion on human suffering, and the importance of serving with humility and not for fame or fortune. Do you remember from our study of Acts and Simon the sorcerer who wanted this power so he could profit from it? Well, Peter must have remembered his disciple training because Peter lowered the boom on Simon that day for having such an evil desire. What do you think were Jesus's teaching points in the second half of the list? I think the overwhelming message must be to trust God for your provisions and don't get bogged down in the planning, but just get moving. Also, the disciples were not to turn off their minds, but Jesus wanted them to use godly discernment when finding a worthy person and when determining if the house was deserving or not. Now, in verses 14 and 15, we encounter one of those challenging verses from Jesus. Let's read it. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. Truly, I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on that day of judgment than for that town. It's clear if the disciples encountered people who rejected the message, they weren't to hang out and continue to try to convince them, but they were to move on with a clear conscience knowing that it wasn't them who were rejected, but it was the message of God that was rejected. 
And as such, their judgment would be worse than the judgment which befell on Sodom and Gomorrah. Jesus didn't sugarcoat God's coming judgment and never should his disciples. It's heartbreaking, but knowing God's judgment should motivate us to enter the harvest field and serve our Lord. Which brings us to our first principle. Jesus' disciples are empowered to advance his kingdom. Jesus' disciples are empowered to advance his kingdom. The term apostle simply means one sent out. Although we are not considered apostles today, we are disciples of Jesus, who have been called by Jesus and sent out into the world by Jesus. So how do we apply this very specific sending in Matthew 10 to our 21st century calling and sending? First, remember we have similar motives and methods. We are moved and have compassion for the lost. We pray to the Lord of the harvest. Second, Remember, the reaping of the harvest is done by all believers. Some are called to go, and some are called to support the goers. Thirdly, remember, we model Jesus' character and commitment when serving, and we don't serve for fame or fortune. But what about you? What does your response to God's call reveal about your trust in God's provisions? And how do you measure success while working in the Lord's harvest field. So let's move on into division two. There, will, there we will see Jesus reveal to the disciples unexpected persecution and unexpected value. How important is it for a coach or a military commander to be brutally honest about the opponent or enemy? Underestimating your opponent leads to underperformance due to overconfidence and usually ends up in a loss and not a victory. Well, in this division, Jesus continues to give it straight to the disciples. And he starts right away in verse 16. And so let's begin reading there. I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Wolves among sheep doesn't sound fair. Why did Jesus use this metaphor? Because a sheep is completely dependent on their shepherd for their lives. A sheep knows his master's voice, and a sheep follows the shepherd, although they are prone to stray. So just like in Division 1, we are back to dependence on God and trusting him for protection and provision. And then, the second part of the same verse, Jesus tells them, since wolves will abound, they need to be as innocent as doves while being as shrewd as snakes. What a powerful combination. The wisdom of the snake and the ability to move in and out without detection like a snake, combined with harmless nature of a dove. Essentially, Jesus was telling them to be clever enough to be exposed to danger while not falling prey to the wolves. From a secular point of view, it might seem the disciples were outgunned, but remember, the disciples were given supernatural power and authority. But if you're going to share the message of the kingdom, people are going to come against you. And some of these people might be the closest family members to you. If you turn your attention to the screen, I have compiled a list of some of the persecution that Jesus said would happen to the disciples. I'm sure hearing about all this unexpected persecution would have gotten the attention of the apostles. I know it gets my attention, but let's quickly run down the list. Handed over to local councils, flogged in synagogues. On Jesus' account, the disciples would be brought before kings, governors, and Gentiles as a witness. Often people become tongue-tied when speaking before authority, but Jesus told them not to worry. The Spirit of God would speak through them. Then Jesus gave them the brutal truth. Their own family members would betray them to death, and they would be hated by everyone. Well, that list makes you want to just jump in and be a disciple, right? 
Well, maybe not. Two years ago, when we did our study of Acts, we read about the disciples experiencing everything that Jesus had listed here, which means the list Jesus gave was to prepare the disciples when Jesus would be gone and the disciples were the apostles leading the church during the early years of church history. Unfortunately, however, we still see persecution happening today. Sadly, the world wasn't done killing Christians in the first century. Christians are the most persecuted people group in the world. When a Muslim converts to Christianity, it's like signing their death certificate. As a result, they're often killed by their own family members as an honor killing. In North Korea, Christians are brutally killed by their government. And in Africa, almost every week, a tragic story comes out regarding Christians being killed and churches being burned down. It was the church father, Tertullian, who said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. But Jesus was not done yet. In verses 23 to 31, he tells us what the disciples are to do when the persecution arises. Please turn your attention to the slide to see a summary list of what Jesus said. Let's run down the list together. When persecution arises, the disciples were to flee to another location and they were to expect persecution and not to let persecution surprise them and not to be afraid when it comes. So don't stop speaking and proclaiming the message of Jesus. All the persecutors can do to you is kill you. Persecutors should be afraid of he who can destroy the soul and body. God the Father values you and your service. Which brings us to our second principle, which is Jesus' message will be opposed, but God values the messenger. Jesus' message will be opposed, but God values the messenger. In this section, we understand that all of us are sent out, but we are not sent away. God is always with us. But what can we expect on our send out? First, we can expect treatment like that of the original disciples, persecution and rejection. Secondly, we are not to be afraid. It's the persecutors who should be afraid of he who can destroy the soul and body in hell. But through the pain of persecution, the light that shines through is that God values us more than we know. And in, in this life, pales in comparison to the next life. So let me ask you, what cost are you not willing to give up to follow Jesus? Does opposition strengthen or weaken your faith? As we continue in the third division, unexpected costs and rewards, Jesus continues to unveil shocking statements to his disciples. And like the other divisions, I summarized and made a checklist of these statements that are in verses 32 through 39, so we can review them quickly. So I'm relying on you guys to read the notes and dive deeper in your discussion groups to pull all the nuggets from each, each one of these statements. So please turn your attention to the slide as I go through the summary of what Jesus said. If you acknowledge Jesus before others, Jesus will acknowledge you before the Father in heaven. Disown Jesus before others, and Jesus will disown you before the Father in heaven. Don't assume the message of Jesus will bring peace to people. It actually brings division. We're called to love Jesus more than our own family members. If not, we're not worthy of Jesus. We're called to pick up our cross and follow Jesus. If not, we're not worthy of Jesus. Whoever finds their life will lose it. But if you lose your life for Jesus' sake, you'll find your life. These are heavy sayings of Jesus, and I wish we could spend more time on each one, but I'm counting on you guys to discuss them more fully in your, in your groups. But I do want to drill down on a couple of statements. First, let's look at verses 34 through 36, where Jesus shocks us by saying, 
He didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. A sword divides. And I'm sure from your own experiences, you have seen how the message of Jesus divides your own family. But <clears throat> what is not mentioned in these verses <clears throat> is the message of Jesus for those who embrace it and believe it brings peace between believing man and God. So <clears throat> in this time of human history, we can have peace between us and God, but there, will, but there will not be true peace on earth in this age. But when Jesus comes back, there will be true peace on earth in the animal kingdom, as well as between men and the nations. Also, circling back to verse 38, where Jesus tells us to take up our cross. This week's BSF doctrinal focus is the cross for the believer. Some of you might not be familiar with this doctrine as with other Bible teachings, but in the BSF notes on page five is a highlighted portion which discusses the doctrine more deeply. Having a good understanding of this doctrine is important because confusion on this doctrine can create in our confusion in our service to God. For example, when you do not believe that God would ask for you to deny yourself or give up your comfort, you end up overvaluing fleeting pleasures and sacrificing eternal rewards. You end up expecting an easy path, fearing opposition, and limiting your impact for Christ's kingdom. When life is hard, you doubt God instead of trusting him. But when you believe that following Christ is costly, you're not surprised when obedience requires sacrifice. But when we deny ourselves, we gain God's faithfulness and the lasting rewards of yielding to him. The obedient believer embraces the cross and recognizes that obedience is worth it. As we move into our last block of scripture for today, verses 40 through 42, we will see Jesus emphasizes the concept of rewards. Do you know who spoke the most about heavenly rewards in the Bible? Well, it was Jesus. And in our study this year, Jesus started speaking about rewards back in chapter six, right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. For a better understanding of Jesus's appealing to our desire to be rewarded, I would recommend going to our YouTube channel. Go to the playlist called Deeper Dive into Matthew and navigate to the video titled, Should Our Good Deeds Be Motivated by Rewards? by Dr. Pennington. Dr. Pennington in the video points out in God's economy, He's going to honor us with heavenly rewards. And Jesus, throughout the gospel, reveals this fact to us. Speaking about rewards makes some of us feel, well, uneasy. Because we operate under an altruistic approach when serving God. But Dr. Pennington points out in the video that altruism is not biblical. God is not asking you to serve in his kingdom without being rewarded for your service. But for most of us, having an altruistic nature is not the problem. The problem for most of us is we are satisfied with earthly rewards as opposed to striving for heavenly rewards. Now, if this is a shocking revelation for you, I would say watch the video and listen to Dr. Pennington's point. The video is less than four minutes long and it's worth watching. Also, it's good to let scripture explain scripture. If you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 through 15, the Apostle Paul also gives us some insight on this issue of rewards. Now that we drilled down on rewards, let's go ahead and read the scripture, starting in verse 40. Anyone who welcomes you welcomes me, and anyone who welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person as a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones who is my disciple, truly I tell you, 
that person will certainly not lose their reward. Now, these verses really encourage me personally, because some of us are not able to participate as much as we would like in the harvest field. But when you support other believing workers in their ministry, you get to share in their reward. Now, thinking horizontally, it's hard to understand how God is going to do all this. But when you trust in an all-powerful, all-seeing God, it's not hard to visualize that God has this portion of his plan under control. And from this section of scripture, we see, the, we see that following Jesus results in earthly sufferings, but brings eternal rewards. Which brings us to our last principle. Proclaiming Jesus on earth brings honor in heaven. Proclaiming Jesus on earth brings honor in heaven. Jesus' words about rewards is encouraging, especially for those who are neck deep in spiritual battles. It's amazing to think that proclaiming Jesus in public will be rewarded. Your willingness to accept rejection will be rewarded. Your sacrifices for Jesus will be rewarded. And your hospitality towards other believers will be rewarded. The implication and application are clear. We are to press on in our mission field. But what about you? When have you decided to follow the path of the cross rather than the crowd this week? Does picking up your cross bring peace or division to your community? In summary of the passage, the disciples had entered an intense training period with Jesus as their mentor, coach, and leader. Soon Jesus would go to the cross and ascend to be with the Father. And these disciples would become the apostles. And they would press on to bring the message of Jesus to a perishing world. And in doing so, they would pick up their cross as they encountered opposition. Which we today are not apostles, but we are workers in the Lord of the harvest field. And since we are, please be intentional about inviting guys out to our Bible study. Let's go ahead and bow and close in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we get ready to head off to our groups, encourage us to share openly and honestly with the other men as we share about the truth of this passage and how it's challenging us or encouraging us. And as the writer of Hebrews says, may the great shepherd of the sheep equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Christ Jesus, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.